Prairie Community Meeting, and tonight we're going to cover a handful of things uh, that are super important for us in the next couple months. So, first we have uh, individuals here from uh, the Census 2020, and uh, they're going to give us a little presentation about the importance of that. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, changes coming up for the, uh, the March election. Uh, LA County's got a whole new system, so we'll, we'll kind of discuss that just so you're aware and everybody out there in the Ethernet internet is uh, aware. And then uh, finally we're going to have a presentation from uh, BHS on the upcoming uh, no smoking ban uh, in public places. And, uh, and if we have any time after that, then we can just open it up to, uh, to any questions. All right, so with that, Linda, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Okay. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Linda Marshall-Smith. I'm from the United States Census Bureau, and I am what's called a partnership specialist. And it's my honor and privilege to get out into the community to work with organizations such as the Redondo Beach uh, City Council um, to help spread word about the upcoming 2020 census, because we have some new innovations uh, happening this time. Um, so first of all, just to give you a little background on the Census Bureau itself. Uh, the Census Bureau is the data collection agency of the United States government. We are in business day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out, collecting uh, survey information as we do studies. We work with a lot of different agencies. We work with private industry. But anything anybody ever puts on one of our surveys remains confidential by law. Um, but every 10 years, we do what's called the census. And the census means the decennial census, every 10 years, where we must count everyone living in America. Doesn't matter if you just moved to America the week before the census starts, but you're intending to stay here, you have to be counted. Um, so that's what we're talking about tonight, is the 2020 census. And the reason we count everyone in America is because by law we have to. It's in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 2 states, the actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of 10 years in such manner as, as how by law it shall direct. So that means every 10 years we have to do this. Now, if you note up there, and I find this really kind of interesting, the first census was in 1790. This year is the 24th census. That means we're only 24 decades old. You know, if you look at it in different terms, it's like the, the kid that graduated from college and he's still living at home, sleeping on the couch, and you're trying to get him to you know, move out and get his own place. That's kind of like you know, the, the age of our country when you think about it, in decades, though. So um, we also do the decennial census because it's about fair representation. We're talking about our voting coming up, even though it doesn't have direct impact. It does uh, determine how we apportion or reapportion the seats in the House of Congress. It's based on population. It's not based on voting, it's based on population. So there are a certain number of seats in the House of Congress, and depending on how many people live in the state is how many representatives you get to fill those seats. So we want to make sure we count everybody here, get a complete count, so we can get our proper representation in the House of Congress. And it's also about redistricting and the disbursements, the money and the power. And the redistricting has to do with voting districts. After the census is completed and, uh, and we submit the final numbers uh, to the executive branch on December 31st of this year, by March 31st of next year, 2021, they will give it to the states who will then determine where the voting districts are going to reside. And those are where the voting districts are for the next 10 years. So everything that, the, every, all the data that this census collects carries through until 2030, for the, until the next census comes along. And it's also about billions of dollars of federal funding that gets dispersed between states, local communities, hospitals. Do we need a new school to be built? Do we need a, a new police force in a community? It's all about the numbers of how many people reside in the community. We have to count everyone because we have to know that you're here. If we know that you're here, we can give you the money to, to give you the services that your community needs. So it's very important that everyone is counted. Um, and as you can see here, this slide, the pictures are kind of small, but um, what it's showing here is that um, 
It's directing funds for services, which I just said, schools, police departments, hospitals, nursing homes, public transportation, daycare, housing, uh, urban planning. Do we need more roads? We need more freeways, that's for sure, here in our area. Um, decision making at all levels of government, um, scientific research, uh, estimating where people that were displaced maybe because of a natural uh, catastrophe or natural disaster, say the fires in Northern California, well how many people were living there before those fires? So we, you know, we, need to, we need to have the data so we can estimate who was misplaced or displaced. Um, and making business decisions. You know, uh, private industry uses the census data. It's actually free to anyone. Anyone in business can go to census.gov and utilize the data. But did you ever wonder where like a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods decides it's gonna put a new store? They use census data. You know, why did they open it in this town, on this block, and not in that town, on that block? Because they use the census data to help make those far-ranging business decisions. So it's very important. Uh, 2020 is going to be easier than ever to complete your census. Um, it's only nine questions, first of all. And for the first time ever, you'll be able to do it either online, on a paper form, by phone, or in person with a census ticket. But uh, if you remember having to do the form, and someone here mentioned the long form, no longer a long form, it's nine questions for everyone. Um, and it should take, it depends on how many people are in the household, one person that lives in the household, it should take you 10 minutes to finish it. If it's a family of four, may take a, it's going to take a little longer because you have to get that, those questions, those nine questions answered for each person that lives at the address. Okay. Um, but easier ways to respond, as I said, uh, you could you do it on your cell phone, you could do it on your you know, iPad or your tablet, you could do it at home on your computer. You can even do it, there are going to be centers around town where you can actually go and complete it there. Uh, you can do it with the census taker when they come to your house. Um, the partnership program, which is what I'm doing right now, getting out to give some advanced information about the census. Because when you get it, you're going to get an invitation in the mail. And we'll get to that in, in just a minute. But you're going to get that invitation in the mail and it's not going to be addressed to, like me, Linda Marshall Smith, Redondo Beach. It's going to be redressed address to current resident, Redondo Beach. So when you get that in the mail, don't throw it out. It's not junk mail, it's important. It will say Census 2020, it will say important, um, but make sure you don't discard it. Okay, so there will be an advertising campaign. Maybe you've seen some of the commercials. They're starting to air now. So a lot of, uh, a lot of ways for awareness is, is happening. Now the response timeline. Um, as I said, an invitation is gonna go out. And they are going to start to go out in the middle of March, like March 12th to 20th or so. Um, if you don't go online and do it, sometimes people are busy, they forget, they put the paper aside, you will get a reminder. A couple of days later, another reminder. A couple of days later, you will get a paper form, in case you prefer to do it on the paper form. And if all else fails, by the like end of April, uh, if you still, we still don't have the data back from an address, we will send out this, the team in the field to go knock on the door. So if you don't want to see a smiling face like myself or like Alana over there, uh, make sure you complete your census when you get it. Do either do it online or on the form or, or on the phone. Okay. Um, your data are confidential. By law, it's Title 13 it's called. We cannot reveal anything that you put on that form to anyone else. No, aid, no other agency, no other, you know, we can't tell the city. You know, sometimes people will say, oh, you know, but I, I have this unpermitted apartment over my garage and my Aunt Susie's living up there. I don't need to count her. I don't want the city to know that I have that apartment there. It's not permanent. I don't want my taxes to go up. We don't tell the city anything. Sorry, we're not a big city. Um, <laughs> we don't tell the city anything because it's about the number and we want to make sure that we count Aunt Susie even if she's living in an unpermitted, uh, as long as it's a habitable residence and she's living there and she's happy, we need to count her with your form. So everyone needs to be counted in the household. Um, we don't share any of this personal information. As a Census Bureau employee, I take an oath on the Bible, not just for today, not just for this year, for the 2020 Census, but for life that I can't share any personal information with anyone else. And if I do, 
I risk a $250,000 fine, five years in jail, or both. So they're very serious about the confidentiality. So serious, in fact, and I have some of these over on the table. This is what's called a webcam cover. It's a little sticker that you can put on your laptop computer or even on your cell phone or on your smart TV just to safeguard to make sure that nobody's looking in at you from the camera behind that, that computer or behind that TV. So the Census Bureau actually publishes these. That's why they're so, you know, their really priority is, is confidentiality. Okay. Um, this is what the <coughs> Census questionnaire is going to look like. Uh, and these are the questions. How many people live or stay in your home on April 1st? Whether the home is owned or rented? The age of each person in the household? The race of each person in the household? whether anyone in the household is of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, the relationship of each person in the household. And so it's like this, you know, this is what the form looks like if you want to do it on paper. Um, we're going to have the paper forms available in English and Spanish. The census takers, when they come to your home, will have on their computers English and Spanish. But the online platform will have the, uh, will have the census available in 12 languages plus English. And if a language or your language is still not on the online form, you can call in and there will be people who can help you in 59 other different languages. So we want to make sure that we count everybody that is, that is living in, in our country. Um, LA County has a lot of what's called hard to count areas or hard to count populations. And they can be any one of these folks, veterans, people experiencing homelessness, children under five, seniors. Um, in the last census in 2010, we undercounted little kids under five by like a million little kids. And if you were to put a dollar value on it, it's estimated at about $2,000 per kid times 10 years, times a million for 10 years. That's an awful lot of money that didn't get dispersed for schools and after school programs and school lunches and teacher training. And, and if you remember, LAUSD teachers went on strike a little while back. And one of their grievances was that the classroom size was too big. Well, that's a direct correlation for the 2010 census that we didn't count the little babies. Because a little baby might only be a year old now. But in 10 years, by the time 1930 comes around, that little baby's going to be 11. And is there going to be a classroom for that little kid? Is there going to be a school lunch for that little kid? So if you guys know people that have young children, make sure, you know, because sometimes the mom will say, oh, I don't need to put her on. She's only six months old. Or I'm afraid to put my baby on. I don't want anybody to know I have a baby. You know, yes, sir. So this was a question that came up at uh, Congressman Lou's thing, but there wasn't really a good answer. If somebody's pregnant yes. while they're taking the census, yes. clearly that child will be 10 by the next census, but they're right. not born. So they're, Right, they're not born yet. But do you count? Um, they have to be born on or before April 1st to be, okay. to be counted. That's, the, that's census day. Um, you were answering. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's April. <laughs> um, uh, so that's the children under five. Sometimes renters. You know, if you guys have properties where you rent out a place or you are a renter, sometimes people think, oh, I don't have to fill out the census. The owner will do it. It's not my house, the owner's house. They'll do the census. Um, or they can also be hard to count because if it's a security building, you know, and they haven't done their form, and the census taker has to go to try to get it in person, and then they can't get into the building for whatever reason, uh, which is why we do outreach to uh, uh, building managers, property managers, that sort of thing, too. But renters can be hard to count. Um, Foreign-born people or people with limited English profici proficiency can be hard to count. And that's why we do it in a lot of languages. But if you look here, this is what's called Los Angeles Low Response Areas. This is a map of Los Angeles County. And uh, this is us kind of over here. This is Redondo Beach right in here. We're kind of in the middle. We're at about a 30 30% non-response rate. Um, but if anything is lower than like 30 or between 20 and 30, it's, it's darker blue. This is where people don't tend to respond. And if you look at this map, that's like maybe half of LA County. That's hard to count. So we do a lot of outreach. We do these kind of meetings with folks like you. And we also hire, when we hire for census takers, we hire in the local community. 
Um, so that you know, you may recognize me from the park or from Trader Joe's or from church or something. So if I come knocking on your door, oh, that woman's a familiar. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll open my door to her. I'll see what she's got to say. And I have my ID and I have my census materials, so uh, you might do the census with me. So we are hiring, um, and we have our, our recruiter here. Um, uh, Elena is our recruiter. If you know anyone uh, or if you guys might be interested, it pays pretty good, $25 an hour. You work in the community. You also get um, mileage for your car if you do have to drive your car. It's like 57 and a half cents per mile. Um, and you make your own schedule. A lot of people do it you know, after work or do it on the weekends. You know, it's extra pay, pay off their Christmas bills, you know, their Christmas charge card expenses. So it's a good way to make some extra money. So if anyone is interested, please um, see Elena before you go. Um, and uh, well, a complete count committee now. This is something, um, Christian, I, we've been trying to work with the Redondo Beach on doing this, and it actually has been approved. We've talked with the city manager, but what we need to do is have a meeting to train you guys on how to run or could have the complete count committee. So I'm going to talk to you after the meeting about that further. A complete count committee is where a, a city or a county um, or even I, I formed a complete count committee at UCLA, which is a city in itself. There's like 150,000 people there between the hospital and the faculties and the doctors and the kids. And, um, so they have formed their own complete count committee. They want to make sure that the people in their community get counted because it means money coming back to the university. And we want to make sure here in Redondo Beach we get counted because it means money coming back to Redondo Beach. So it's, it's important. Um, so how can you know we partner? How can I partner with you guys? You know, would you spread this message to your friends and family? When the census comes, be sure you fill it out. If you do know people that might be interested in working or if you have work at companies or uh, own your own companies, make sure that you would spread the word within your companies. Um, some local partnership strategies. Um, do we, are there any teachers here this evening? No. Okay, so I won't go into this. Um, the statistics in schools program. I won't go into that. So next steps are to help assess uh, Redondo Beach's uh, community resi readiness to participate in the census. Do you think everybody here is ready? Do you think that everybody's going to be willing to do it? Work to mobilize the community, maybe form the complete count committee or work on one. Share news of the census with your friends and families. Um, invite someone like me to give this presentation at your office or at your work or any other organizations you belong to and apply for our jobs or spread the word about them. So the timeline, you can see we've been working on this since even before 2017. Um, we are in the beginning of 2020 now. The advertising is going to start, you're going to start to see more and more commercials airing about census. Census Day is April 1st. When we send out the teams into the fields, it'll be late April. The apportionment counts go to the executive branch December 31st, and then the redistricting counts go to each state on March 31st of next year. This is some information about recruiting. You can take a picture of this or see we have some information at the back table there. Shape your future, start here, be sure you complete your census form. And this is me and my contact information. Um, and I just want to share one other thing besides this. We have these great posters that have been printed up. And I don't know, Christian, if you'd want to take these or keep these and maybe put them somewhere at the office or something. Um, this is one, <laughs> it's kind of cute. It, sh it shows about the confidentiality. We protect your data like you protect your kids in bubble wrap. I don't know if you protect your kids in bubble wrap, but you get the idea. Um, this is one which I just love, this picture. This is to remind people to make sure they count their little babies one to five or zero to five. Um, this is one about the children are our future. Make sure we count all our kids and make sure we have enough resources for our kids as they are aging into the school system. And this one is about health care making sure that our healthcare facilities get the funding that they need. So um, we have these posters, they are available. If any of you uh, have any locations where you think they might be good to put up, I'm happy to deliver them there. And I think that's it, does anyone have any questions? I don't have any kids, but if you have a college age kid who says, go, go to college in Texas, say, so mm -hmm. count here, count here. 
they would be counted at their dorm in Texas. So you would not count them. But if they go to school, say at UCLA, but they're living at home with you, they would be counted at your house. So it's where they live or stay most of the time. And it's like if you're at a place six, six months, one day, that's considered most of the time by the census. So if somebody is staying in a place at least six months and one day, then that's where they're counted. Because sometimes people have second homes or they have a beach house or they, you know, they travel to Europe or something. But where they live and stay most of the time is where they're counted. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How do you prevent fraud with all these iPhones and iPad options of getting it? information in. Well, this, this is the first time ever the census is available to do online on the internet. It took them all this time to figure things like that out and to safeguard against those things. And there are uh, algorithms and scientific stuff going on behind the scenes that we don't even know what it's called or exactly what it does or how it does it. They won't tell us because it's that well, secret. That's what happened it's in too. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, 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 you know, and, and imagine, you know, there are an estimated, as of some of the other surveys and stuff that we do on a, on a regular basis, there's an estimated 334 million people in the United States, estimated, based on our other, uh, our other studies. So imagine 334 million people go into the website on March 12th to try to answer their, <laughs> their census. I hope it doesn't crash. Uh, but we have staggered it. It's going through from March 12th to March 10th, and we and we figured that a lot of people aren't going to do it right away, and people will need to be nudged a little bit and things like that. Um, but they spent years trying to work all that out and and protect against the security and the privacy of it too, so that it's you know hackable. Yes, sir. So when is? I think they're, they've released the 1930 censuses. 1940. 1940, so what, they release 1950 pretty soon then? 72 years. Okay. So 1950 will be 72 years from 1950, which would be, I don't know, when we do the math, I guess. And it's still Laguna and Aguilar you have to go down to to see that? Uh, you know, that I'm not sure. I don't know that, but I could find it out, like Christian, no, I, I'm not sure. But we do release the information, and, and at that point we do release personal information because uh, that's also by under another law that we, we are able to do that after sort of three and a half generations pass by. We can release information because people do want to know, oh, look, this is where my great-grandfather lived. He, he was born in Brooklyn. Or, oh, look, at this is my great-grandmother's signature when she lived in, you know, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Or genealogy studies and things like that, people do want to know. So after 72 years, they do release the census data. But by that time, I'm going to be long gone. I'm not going to worry about people getting my address. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and, the, and and when it comes to the confidentiality too, um, I really want to stress that because you guys, if you go to Amazon.com and buy something at Amazon, you're giving Amazon more personal information than we ask for, and you're doing that kind of freely and stuff. You know what I mean? So it, the census doesn't ask for bank account information, social security information, no, you know, nothing like that just those questions that I should. So I have on the table a lot of flyers and things. I have some fun things too, if you guys want a backpack or a water bottle or some other chip clips, some other things. Um, I have a bunch of these if you want to take, put on your computer at home, these webcam things. Um, uh, and I'll be there at the back till the end, so if you have any other questions or if you want to sign up to work with us. Come see us after the meeting. Thank you so much, Christian. Yeah. So, Linda, uh, so a couple, couple oh. things. So, uh, you, you want people to go online primarily, right? Because yes. uh, that's the easiest. Yes. And then, if they have not filled it out online by April one, and that that's when they're going to start getting more things in the mail, and yes. uh, and eventually somebody at their door. Somebody. At their door. And they're going to keep coming until you. And they will it. keep knocking on the door until yeah. they get the desk. <laughs> So the point being, <laughs> fill it out online and nobody knocks <laughs> and on nobody your door. Nobody knocks on the door. Okay. Yeah. And okay. the other thing is too, you know, if you belong to like the next door, anybody in here belong to next door website? Yeah. Yes. You know, you might start seeing people post, oh, there's somebody walking around in the neighborhood saying they're with the census. You will be able to identify a census worker. They will have a badge on. Um, they will have, a, do you have your briefcase, Elena? Could you show your briefcase on your badge too? I don't have my badge with me. They will have a briefcase that looks like this that says uh, census. 
they will be carrying that briefcase. They will have their identification badge with them, with the uh, right, um, and they will have a census uh, device, whether it's an iPad or a cell phone or some kind of mini computer, to do the survey with. Um, you could also they will be able to give you a phone number. You can call the office to confirm they are a census worker. So um, if you think somebody is suspicious, but let me give you a tip. If the same person, if I keep coming and knocking on your door and you see me in your ring doorbell, and I've been there like five or six times, if I was trying to scam you or break into your house, I'm not coming back five or six times with my mug on your ring doorbell. You know what I mean? Because the police are going to be able to identify me right away. So if somebody is being that persistent to try to get your data, because it's very important for those reasons I said, you know, but our congressmen, how many congressmen the state of California has, how many, uh, what the voting district boundaries are gonna be and how much money we're gonna get. You know, it's taxpayers' money, you guys have paid the money. So I wanted to come back into our community and not go to Wisconsin. Not that I have anything against Wisconsin, but I wanted to come back here. Yes. Okay. Suppose you have a congressman who's afraid his district is going to be wiped out. Okay? okay. And so I know this doesn't happen anywhere except Cook County, Illinois. But suppose <laughs> he goes and pays all of his friends to all of a sudden have three, four, or five kids, even when they don't have any. But How do you catch that? They do, as I said, have ways behind the scenes, algorithmically and scientifically, to guard against it. And they also check against other data that's been collected elsewhere to see, well, two months ago, this person only had one kid. How did they all of a sudden have 10 kids in this house? They can, you know. So it's based they, on address? It's based on address. It's not based on anyone personally. So it comes to your address. You know, it comes to an address. And then we have to count everybody at that address. So. I have someone that is using my address. It's an old worker. Uh huh. And for whatever reason, he's been using my address. I've contacted all kinds of people. And so someone will wonder how come he gets mail at my house still. Interesting. Yeah. But he's not living there. Oh, it has so never. You, right, so you would not count him. Absolutely not. <laughs> I wouldn't want to count him. No, no you don't count him. But you won't be counting him. You don't count him. <laughs> but if I were to come and stay with you and I'm going to be there for six months, right. then you gotcha. would count me. What happens if that person is a overseas visitor a couple of days for six months? You count them. Even though you know that for the next 10 years they won't be there. Right. But if they're here now, and if they're going to be here for six months and a day, they get counted. Yeah. They get counted. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you. Of Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I was hoping to have another slideshow because uh, the presentation I saw last week was was really interesting. We we did talk about this, but um, it was uh, we were talking specifically, which Linda just referred to, about our congressional districts, right? So she mentioned that uh, this count really determines not only congressional districts throughout the United States. But, um, but the funding and resources that can come to those congressional districts. And what was really fascinating was out of the 53 congressional districts in, uh, in California, the slowest growing district is Ted Lieu's district. <laughs> so it's the, 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 out of all 53, the, the slowest growing. So, uh, so that means in previous counts, there are uh, when you compare it against all the other counties, we are growing incredibly slowly, right? Which is kind of funny because we always talk about growth here in town a lot. But um, but so it's super important for us. So I, I highly recommend, go, what is the website again? www.2020census.gov. Well, www you can go to the website for more information. Uh, that information will be on a lot of these flyers here. Uh, when you get your invitation in the mail, you will get a specific URL to go to to complete your form. There will be code on that, on that letter that you will type in when you get to the website. The interesting thing is, however, you don't really even need the code to complete your census. You could come to the library, like say the main library in Yonga Beach is gonna have a, a, a questionnaire assistance center there. You can just go and fill it out just by putting your address in. 
So you don't even need the code, but you will get a special code. Uh, okay, so www.2020census.gov. Okay, and, uh, and, and the one thing I will point out is that uh, they are concerned that California is gonna lose a congressional district this year. So keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, Donna. What's that? Um, you continually say that this is used for the federal designation of districts. Is it not also used for the state outlining of districts? Yes, it will be. That's right. It'll have a direct effect on how things are redrawn, uh, but that that'll be done at a state level. But yes, all the infor yeah. the information will translate back to the state after right. after it's done uh, right. on a federal March, basis. They, in March, they get accounts. The and we get that account. we get that information in twenty twenty one though, yes. right? Yeah. March so. And, and as we know, right, we talk about stuff that, that, that has direct impacts on our arena numbers, all, all the things that we're, we're hyper-focused on these days. So, uh, so it, will be, it will be important to make sure we get an accurate count. So, so. And, and, you know, it's all based on population. And as I said, even, even business makes decisions based on population. Um, I have a partner, the, the, the National Association of Music Merchants, and they have their big trade show in Anaheim uh, in January. It's called the NAM Show. Uh, and 115,000 attendees and 200, I mean 2,000 plus uh, exhibitors. I mean, it's a huge thing at the Anaheim Convention Center. And when I first called them to uh, request if we could get a booth there and you know share the music with census, um, the person that picked up the phone happened to be their senior research analyst, and she said, "You know what? I use census data all the time for for, for the work that we do here at the association." So people use the data, and it's available to anyone. It's available to small business. It's available, you know, say you're a, a French chef, and you want to open a high-end French restaurant in our community here, and you want to have appetizers that are going to be $25 an appetizer. Well, you're going to go to the census data to see if the median income of our community is going to be able to support having $25 appetizers in this community. And if not, well, maybe your appetizer is going to have to be <laughs> you know, or you're going to open your friend, fancy you friend's restaurant somewhere else. Where do you get the income else. information? Pardon me? Where do you get the income information? Yeah. It's statistically available at census.gov. But it's not it's part not of your nine questions. It's not part of no, it's, no, it's, we don't it ask it. We don't ask it in, on, the, on the census, but we do ask it on, as I said, remember when I started, the Census Bureau is in the business of collecting data and doing studies and surveys all the time. And there is another, there are other surveys that, that uh, just focus on the employment and unemployment, other surveys that focus on people who may participate in programs such as food stamps, or Medicare, uh, uh, another study that focuses on uh, the economic situation, what the cost of living increase is gonna be at the end of the year, the COLAs, that's from uh, information that the Census Bureau collects from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, what Social Security is going to go up at the end of the year, that's from our work. Um, and we have one study called the American Community Survey, which is more, it's actually the census long form, but it's been separated out and away from the census, and it's a separate study, and that's where we ask about people's income and how long it takes them to commute to work. We look at traffic patterns, commuting patterns in that study, a lot of different but this is the only mandatory requirement. The other stuff is all voluntary. No, the American Community, the American Community Survey is also mandatory. The other ones are voluntary. But they're samples. You know, it's a sample. So if your house and your household can get sampled for one of those surveys right after or before you do your census, and you're going to say, oh, but I just did my census. I don't have to do this. Well, you know, as a sample, you're representing thousands of other households. So you do, if it's one of the volunteer studies, you do have the right to, to pass and say, no, I don't want to do it. But if you do that, then you're silencing the voices of like 5,000 other households in our community. So that's not good either. Yeah, so, Ron, so don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Come on, man. <laughs> and everything is, as I said, you know, it's kept confidential. You know, I, I, I couldn't go home and tell my husband, oh, I met this really great guy and he works for this company and he makes this much money and I could, if I were to do that, I could go to jail for five years. And they're, you know, pretty serious about that stuff. So. Okay, so 2020census.gov after March 12th. Available uh, online to do online, it. Or you could wait for the paper form, or you could, you know, wait for the 
That's I know everybody in this room will do it on March 12th, so <laughs> I feel super confident in that. Okay. Um, Thank you. All right, you're welcome. So there are materials over there that you guys can take and swag, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, yeah, and there's more material. They can go to the, to the website, too, for other information, anybody oh, yeah. who's out there, right? Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. All right, perfect. So uh, I said we would do a lecture, but I'm going to actually jump to you guys first so you don't have to sit around for the whole meeting. So uh, in the past, uh, in the past like five months, we uh, the council passed a public no smoking ban. Uh, so that's all public spaces, um, and then we also created some other uh, regulations as it relates to selling tobacco to minors and stuff like that in stores. Um, but you guys are going to talk specifically about the no smoking mm -hmm. ban, right? Okay. So, and you're from behavioral. Health services. Okay, so you want to come on up? Sure. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Christine, and this is Alix, and we're from Behavioral Health Services. Okay. And um, first off, I want to thank uh, Council um, Burbat for um, his leadership and actually spearheading. Um, the ordinance that was passed and is effective on November 14th, uh, 2009, uh, which, uh, if you may... 2019 when? Oh, 2019, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's it also um, Yeah, that's when it was effective, uh, November 14th. Um, yeah, so Redondo Beach has a citywide smoking ban in outdoor public areas, and um, BHS collaborated with Beach City's Health District um, in support of, his or of this ordinance to protect residents from secondhand smoke and the dangerous chemicals emitted from vaping. Um, we are working um, with, uh, we're working on education, uh, educating residents with a new law through presentations and also we made flyers with the information that I'll pass out. Mm -hmm. Just a little more information on the citywide smoking ban. It applies to all outdoor public places, so outdoor dining areas, sidewalks, courtyards, the pier, beaches, parks, farmer's market, any outdoor public area you can think of, it applies to. Um, all tobacco products such as cigarettes, cigarillo, cigars, and electronic smoking devices are prohibited in these areas and marijuana or any plant-based product intended for inhalation are also prohibited in these areas. Um, this ordinance also declares smoking a public nuisance. So any person injured by a violation of this ordinance may bring a civil action against the perpetrator. And lastly, um, when it comes to youth, there's been a rise in vaping among youth. So any persons under the age of 21 caught on the school grounds with uh, any tobacco product will have to perform community service and attend a joint police department and school approved anti-tobacco and nicotine diversion program. And um, that's all the information about that ordinance. If you have any questions, we're here to answer any questions you have about secondhand smoke or vaping. And we're also conducting um, more formal educational presentations about these new laws and any community organizations. And um, we hope that you inform your neighbors and res any friends about this as well so more people are aware of this. And we're going to be distributing flyers to businesses, um, getting some posters made. And um, if the city wants, we can also help with getting signs made that can be posted around the city as well. So we'll be working with the city on that. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. March election, uh, things are going to change up. The LA County, um, the LA County Registrar uh, and County Clerk's Office now, uh, we're, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Uh, we're going to have things called vote centers. Um, you're going to be able to vote for up to 12 days ahead of election day uh, at the North Branch Library. That's one location. 
uh, down at Alta Vista Park. You'll be able to vote, uh, I believe, four or five days ahead of election day uh, there uh, on the racquetball courts. And then on election day, there will be vote centers um, or you know just normal polling places uh, like you're used to. So, and, and a lot of them are gonna be at uh, at the schools uh, like we were used to. So there's gonna be, um, Beach City Health District will have one, uh, Jefferson Elementary, Lincoln Elementary, Madison, Paris, uh, the North Library, uh, Riviera United Methodist Church, Church Toledo. Um, so all these places you'll be able to go vote. What's interesting is, yeah, yeah, Ron. Um, I was confused when I read through the materials that we got in the mail. It yeah. sounded like a place like Jefferson was going to be open up for the whole period, which didn't make any sense. No. Jeff so uh, my understanding is Jefferson and most of the other, the, the North Branch Library will be open for 12 days. And, uh, and the Alta Vista Racquetball Courts will be open for four days ahead of Election Day. Um, Jefferson, Toledo, all those other ones I just listed will be open on Election Day. Um, but what's interesting about these vote centers is you can go clearly at any time, but you don't have to go to a vote center here in Redondo Beach. So say you travel downtown for work, you can go to a vote center in downtown and vote. You can actually, uh, through your phone or online, you can fill out your ballot online and get a QR code and go to the vote center, scan that QR code, and it'll pull up everything you did, and then you can check everything at the ballot, uh, you know, at this vote uh, electronic vote center, um, <coughs> check it all, and then submit it. Uh, now, I, I, going back to the question about like safety uh, with the census, um, apparently what they're doing is you, you can make these choices, as I said online, but that does not. Um, that does not tabulate your vote, right? It just gives you a QR code. You still have to go in physically, unless you're doing a vote by mail type situation. You still have to go in physically, and these machines are not connected to the internet per se, right? So you'll fill out your information, you'll double check it, it'll actually print out a copy of your choices, you'll get to review that, and then you will submit that, that paper copy and it goes into, kind of like the way we, we used to put the ballots into a, uh, you know, a box, you know, right before you leave. So uh, they are trying to ensure, uh, you know, safe safety for your ballot and uh, and a paper trail. Um, but, uh, but again, like I was saying uh, before you, you jumped in there, Ron, you could technically go vote anywhere. Any of these vote centers, you're allowed to vote at throughout the entire county. So, um, so they're trying to make it as easy as possible for everyone to vote. Um, uh, so I'm gonna. There's the website here for. Um, Chris, for yeah, go ahead. What's the identity requirements? What is the what? Ident identification requirements. If you go, if you can go anywhere, how, how, how do you know who's who? Yeah, it's a, it's it's a good question. I think they're still gonna uh, they're they're gonna check your ID. I don't know exactly how. And what we can do is I, I have a video here that they that they've sent us, so we can watch the video and. Uh, and see if that addresses it, yeah. But um, usually you go in and they have the ruler, right? Yeah. And they strike you through your, your name. So why don't we, let's see what the... Uh... It's about to get much easier. In 2020, you will have many voting options. Traditional polling places will be replaced with fully accessible vote centers that will be conveniently located throughout the county will no longer be limited to voting at an assigned polling location on election day. You may vote at any vote center near your home, work, or favorite park, and voting will begin 10 days before election day. Our new accessible and secure ballot marking device allows voters to use the same device to mark their ballot. It features a user-friendly touchscreen, a tactile keypad with headphones to listen to an audio ballot, and a dual switch or AV switch for use with compatible assistive technologies. You can select your language, change the font size, and adjust the contrast for easy viewing. The ballot marking device allows you to mark and review your selection and make any changes. Once you are satisfied with your selection, cast your paper ballot directly into the secure integrated ballot box. Vote center staff will be available for assistance. You also have the option of using the new interactive sample ballot. Before you arrive at a vote center, access the interactive sample ballot online. Independently mark your selections, 
and generate a poll pass that you can print or save on your mobile device. Bring your poll pass to a vote center, scan it on the ballot marking device to transfer your selections, review your selections, make any changes, and cast your ballot. If you are unable to visit a vote center, you may vote using the newly redesigned vote by mail ballot. Mark your selection directly onto the vote by mail ballot using blue or black ink. Sign the postage paid return envelope and drop it into a mailbox or one of the vote by mail drop off locations throughout the county. You may request a vote by mail ballot by completing and returning the back page of your sample ballot booklet, calling our office, or by visiting lavote.net. Don't worry, your I Voted sticker is included in your vote by mail packet. Welcome to the future of voting in Los Angeles County. Fast, convenient, and easy. Visit www.lavote.net to learn more about the new voting experience. Or call 1-800-815-2666. For TDD, call 562-462-2259. Christian? Yes, Don. We had the uh, registrar at one of the voting machines at the NRBVA this morning, and they missed a couple of things here, uh, that they brought forward. Yeah, firstly, I tried to have that guy come tonight, but he never, he never got back to me. <laughs> firstly, um, you can register to vote at these machines as late as the day of voting. Okay. So anybody who is not registered can register up to the day, election day. On after election day, meetings. you can register to vote. They will hold the ballot aside till they confirm your information, but you can register without going anywhere else. So it, it's considered like a provisional ballot in a sense. Yes. Yeah. Um, whatever they're doing to check your identity is countywide. So. If you sent in a mail-in ballot and they have received it and you go to try to vote in person, they will know and you will not get to vote. Um, so if it crosses in the mail, then they'll, they'll reluctantly make a provisional ballot, but that's the only way there will be provisional ballots. Also, uh, we're accustomed to seeing early release of information on election day for the vote by the, the absentee ballots. Um, they will be able to tally at least the first nine days of voting, which will all be presented at that same early time. So we'll have a bigger percentage shown. Unfortunately, because of the size of these ballots, they say it will take them longer to actually do the counting in the end run. So the final tally may take longer than also, so the, the centers are open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., except on election voting day. day when they will be open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. as normal. Okay. So voting centers are open 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. for the nine days, election day, 7 a.m. Actually, to 8 12 p.m. days all 12. the way through. Even though they, they've staggered it so that there's a certain number that are open for the 12 days, then it increases heavily for the last four days, and then, as you've said, on, on the ballot day, I, I guess they're going even more hot water. Okay. All right. I think the bottom, oh, the other thing that's of interest to Redondo Beach is that though the machines are not set up for this now, they have the capability of doing, um, uh, gra what do you call it? graduated voting? One, two, rank, three? Ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting. Yeah. That is something that they can do down the line with the system. Councilwoman MD and I have actually been trying to push for that. So, ranked choice voting just means uh, you can, does everybody understand what that is? Okay. You can vote for your top candidate and you can vote for your second tier and your third tier. So, if for some reason, in a local election, that person doesn't get enough votes to to win. Then they start to look at all the second and third choices. Uh, MVP. Okay. What's that? It's an MVP voting. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, any questions about the uh, the vote centers or this question still not answered? What's the security? To yeah. I you know, I, I I wish they had come tonight. <laughs> they had an open invitation. Um, so let's see. 
Don, so the information I have here says that uh, February 18th is the last day to register to vote. Let me read what's in the parentheses here. Voters can register to vote at voting centers until the close of poll election day. So you are right. Look at that. That is very interesting. Uh, however, yeah, it, is, it is considered a conditional registration. The county must verify eligibility of the voter before the ballot would be counted. So then those are ballots that would take 30 days to, to probably get counted. Um, I already got my, you should have already gotten your, if you are a vote by mail person, it should have come in the mail. Um, if you have not gotten it by today, then I would contact the county registrar. They, they should have come out last week, so they said wait about a week, give it, you know, time, but if you don't it's have it by also another pamphlet that lists all of the voting locations. There's another pamphlet that is all throughout the county. Three, yeah. yes. three pamphlets already. Yeah, okay. Um, the third one. Okay. Yeah. February 25th is the last day to request a vote by mail ballot, and then March 3rd is the election day. And as uh, Don said, voting centers open at 7 and close at 8. Um, so now there's, there is one interesting thing we should point out, and I don't know if they talked about it at your meeting this morning, but Beverly Hills is suing LA County right now because with this new, uh, this new screen situation, right? There's a, a more and a next button, right? So uh, if we look at the, the Democratic, say, presidential primary, there's so many candidates, they don't all fit on one screen. And apparently you have to hit a more button to go to another screen to see the, the candidates beyond that. Well, they now, addressed that. They said the reason for that, there's a maximum of four listings per page because they needed to a, have a certain size font by law, and B, are looking to make certain that all those uh, who are looking at it can read it, so even those that are handicapped. And that's why there's an audio system. So if you're blind, you can come and you can vote at this system. So uh, I, saw, I saw you laugh. Um, uh, at any rate, uh, that's what they said. That's how they right. addressed but, it. But the, the point, I think and, why and let me tell you, having worked on it, there is a significant size more button. And if it, if, if it only goes to a second page, then the more button's at the top so you can go back to the first page. Right, I think that the problem was is that the next button is activated at any time as opposed to, you know like when you get a, a, an EULA for a software and you have to scroll all the way to the bottom before it allows you to click I agree. I think that's that's the point of contention here is that they want to make sure everybody is looking at all the candidates, you know, before they move to the next uh, the next thing that they're going to vote on. So I don't know if the uh, the registrar's office is is going to have that fixed, but I want to make sure that everybody's aware that hit the more button until you have made your choice or you've seen your choice, and uh, and then move on. Uh, Just so. know that there's two or three checks. Firstly, you go through the whole thing, and in the end, it shows you on the screen what you voted for. Uh, it shows you where you didn't vote, what you did vote for, with that ballot. That's yeah. when it goes into the lockbox in the back. Um, let me ask you this, since they came and spoke with you this morning. Uh, I'm one of those people who likes to take my vote by mail sometimes into the polling place. You know, a lot of people that. like, you know, even though they're voting by mail, they feel comfortable going to the polling place. What, uh, are they gonna have collection boxes for? Yeah. Okay, so. You're welcome <laughs> to bring that in with you. Okay, all right. And drop it off. They didn't say that you have to convert it or anything else. Beautiful. Just said bring it in, pick up your sticker. All right. And actually, on the last page, it tells you, please pick up your sticker on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, good. Well, I wish I wish we had had somebody here from, uh, from the clerk's office, but. Uh, they are not. So, uh, any other questions about the elections? All right. So, uh, then the meeting now can go to whatever it wants to go to. So, we are we are open for it. Yes, Gar. Um, the intersection at Inglewood Avenue and 182nd Street yeah. continues to be a huge problem. People okay. are largely ignoring the uh, turn restrictions. Like, I was out there with a couple of neighbors the other day, and every single cycle of light somebody's making a during the during the restricted during the restricted times, okay. you know, people are honking horns. There's a lot of anger. Yeah, um, 
there's going to be there's going to be a um, there's going to be a learning curve. We had this same situation on um, Anita and Paulina Maria when we put it in. I mean, people were still making the turn, so we just you know have to send spot enforcement out. Uh, you know, to, to kind of keep doing it. I know people were getting warnings and uh, and stuff in the past couple of weeks. So because yeah, I was I was getting complaints point. about that. Uh, you know, I about need more enforcement. Definitely. Okay. So then we'll we'll uh, we'll ask Jenny. I think maybe along those lines, hi, Jack. <laughs> um, the signage. I know I hadn't got back to your email, but you had mentioned that there wasn't room. You know, initially when this was talked about, God, over a year now. Um, Public Works said there was like this protocol that they follow of like putting the the electronic signs warning drivers that a change or restrictions were coming, um, and that was part of the reason we were told why it was taking so long because of the whole Inglewood construction that was going on. They needed those signs and they, we couldn't use them for the turn restrictions. Um, but the turn restriction signs never, the warning signs have right. never come, and I happen to live on 182nd Street and. For many days, there's been there has been some enforcement, and just it's amazing how many police officers are being, or you know, how how many people are being pulled over. I mean, eight cars deep are still making the turn. So I spoke with a few of the police officers, and what they said is a lot of people aren't realizing. Um, maybe that's what everyone says when they're trying to evade a ticket or something, but a lot of people aren't realizing it. So, one, my question is, are we still going to get those? signs. I, I think you had talked about maybe putting one here because it didn't fit quite by the intersection. I requested putting it up uh, closer to Ripley and Grant because then there's enough space for it. Like, their concern was they couldn't put it down by your intersection because there's no roadway, right? And so I said, well, put it up a little bit further because then you'll give people the warning to know that if you go down that way, you're not going to be able to turn. If it's not there and it hasn't gone up yet, then I'll just follow up with them. And uh, and then the other thing that I did as a result of like you know emails from you guys was I said that a city manager that we need a um, just kind of a a protocol for when we do make these kind of changes throughout the city. Um, that this is how it's going to roll out. The council, after the council makes an approval and sets that whatever the date is, you know, for when something's going to happen, that X amount of time beforehand, the signs have to go up, you know, and then there's going to be a two week, say, warning period with spot enforcement, you know, just things that kind of help people ease into it um, because. I've, I've noticed that we're, we're doing it different every time we do something around town, and I, I think it would just make it easier if we all knew this is how it's going to roll out. Yeah, I, I'm surprised to hear that from you because um, the traffic, the city traffic engineer is the one who sort of said that this is this is this is the protocol. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't horrible. seem to me like there is a uh, a strict protocol for it. So mm -hmm. what I'd rather say is I'd rather have it be kind of set in stone. Right. And then, you know, then, then uh, PD, from their perspective, can say, okay, they have enough lead time to schedule in spot enforcement, you know, specifically for those areas that have, have now had a recent, you know, change, right? Um, that, that's all. I just want to make sure that we're, right. because uh, I was getting complaints that people were getting ticketed, and my understanding was people were going to get warnings first, uh -huh. you know, right. and, and then exactly. if they were, if they were continuing to violate then they would get a ticket uh -huh. but you know um, I think they'll they'll be uh, a little bit of time here to your point uh, Gar for people to realize that there is a change and uh, during those times and then they'll they'll change their behavior and start using Artesia or uh, or grant to uh, to circumvent that that left-hand turn and for those of us who haven't been down there can you tell us where the signs are posted the signs are posted at Inglewood and 182nd. So if you're going southbound on we are on the right hand side, or is it up there by the light? Um, to be honest with you, I, I haven't seen it yet. There's I haven't driven the down there. On the southeast corner, and there's also another one on the southwest corner. Well, that seems ridiculous to me. If I'm yeah. turning left, why am I looking over at the curb on the right hand they side are, to yeah. get instructions? Yeah. Why is there not a sign that, that right up question. there on the <laughs> stoplights going across? Uh, we see that at intersections all the time yeah. where it talks about no, it's a good it's a good question so i will have to ask public works on tuesday about that okay yeah i, I thought what 
PD, maybe someone mentioned they were maybe concerned about the wind because they got the extra large signs okay. that posting it up on the light, something about the wind could potentially bring it down. But that, that, that could be a possibility <laughs> because we've we've actually talked about changing that um, that uh, hardware at that intersection and that that requires completely new hardware from the ground up. So uh, that that always could be a possibility. I'm not aware. We'll just have to ask public works. Yeah, it seems maybe like a signage issue too because I. I mean, there were three cops many days, and just 10 cars pulled over. Sometimes a cop would pull over three or four cars at a time, and people were still just making the turn. So that makes me yeah. think people genuinely are not understanding the turn restrictions. And that's a bit, it's a busy intersection, so it's, it's going to take a little bit of time, but, but I appreciate it, and we'll, we'll just keep you know, kind of working on it until we get it sussed out. Uh, all right, what else? Ron, and then so, go back. Is there any enforcement of this non-smoking ban? I mean, we have dogs in the park, and there's no enforcement of the anti-dog rules. Are they gonna? It's gonna be another toothless uh, law. It's gonna be something that is enforced if it's seen by somebody who can do the enforcement. But they are not walking around looking for people uh, trying to to catch you smoking. It's just if they happen to see you, you can get a ticket. Yeah. So uh, guard them. Um, Green Line Extension, that's yeah. rearing its ugly head again. Yes. Um, they've approved the DEIR, so they... They're starting, the they're starting, starting the scoping process now. Like yeah. this month. Mm -hmm. um, they say they're starting road shows again. In yeah, April. they're going to do, do meetings again, uh, outreach meetings, uh, yeah. as part of the beginning of the scoping process. I don't have dates for those yet, but that will be yeah. set. Can we get someone to come in and speak Yeah, we can, do another, we can do another meeting in here. Uh, uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna be doing a lot more outreach as a part of that process now that it's officially been approved by the board to to start. So, but I'll make sure that we do a, a meeting here as part of it. Matthew, I'm gonna mention the smoking ban. Is the city gonna put up signs to say no smoking or public any signs so, across the city? To we haven't had a conversation about it, but I know that they mentioned uh, you know putting up signage. So I think probably in specific places, uh, parks or uh, or down by the pier or whatnot, um, any place that maybe doesn't already have that type of signage, yes, it would go up. I don't think, we're not going to put it up on every street corner. Um, um, not every street corner, but as but, an example, uh, when Herbal said they're smoking man, they have signs. They did, they did a whole branding campaign around exactly. it. Yeah, so, and, I, and I think we should, so I, I don't, I have not uh, followed up with the health district and staff to see like what are we planning to do to educate people. Uh, but but I think Hermosa did the right thing. You've got to have a little bit of a campaign around it to build the awareness. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, it's a quiet group tonight. I missed the I missed the last meeting, but what was the status of the garbage thing? The two bin, the two bin versus the three bin. The status of the garbage thing? Yeah, exactly. All the garbage now will be dropped at your house <laughs> on Hanks. <laughs> no. Uh, Put in as many bins as you like. Um, so, so the, the yeah. what and council has now approved this. So the last meeting we talked about the two way stream uh, process. So Matthew, uh, it lives in a segment of District Three. Actually, might you might be in that yeah. segment too. There, yeah. Um, so, uh, so we're switching to two way streams. All right. What that means is your your gray barrel and your blue barrel will be picked up by the same truck. And they will be taken to the same facility, and it will be sorted there. They will they will actually have probably higher diversion rates of because what we've learned is that a lot of people are not recycling the right things. So uh, in this case, everything will go to one one area. It'll be sorted by the Athens people, uh, the blue and gray barrels together, and um, and that'll be taking place uh, in the area of District Three where you are and Matthew is. Uh, and then all of District 4 and a small section of District 5. And we're going to do that for six months. Uh, so that'll be only two trucks coming uh, down your street uh, during, the, during the day. And, uh, and then we will evaluate it and see, you know, uh, how, how is it functioning and working. And, uh, and it'll come back to the council for an evaluation at that point. Don? Isn't it true that, um, that commercial trash has always been sorted in that manner and that really the only reason for saying you want a recycled bin is because
because you don't pay for a recycled bin, and if you have enough recycled bins, you don't put, you, you can reduce the size of your regular bin, which is what you pay for. But it was my understanding that 100% of all commercial waste is already going through a smart. I don't, um, I don't know. Uh, they, they definitely, the, in, under the new contract with Athens, there are requirements related to state laws for diversion where they will have to separate out now at commercially, I think, organics, possibly from the recyclable and wet trash. Um, I'm not 100% positive. So commercial trash all might go to the, the MRF like you're talking about. Um, and the MRF is the, their, one of their facilities where they, they do all this sorting. Um, uh, but we don't pay, uh, with, with our contract with Athens, and I don't know if it was the, different the, than the previous residential one. is different. Yeah. I'm simply addressing commercial yeah. from my record. Okay. Yeah. No. I'm. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. But. Uh, but we can always ask that question of Athens. So. So the green stays the way it is. The green stays the way it is. Yeah. And. Uh, and you know. I think what they're going to even try to do is because uh, we talked about it and we said you know we they can always come back to another meeting is a lot of people are also confused about what can Holly and I were just talking about it before the meeting what can go in the green barrel right um, it's it's all organics uh, so you can technically. Um, a lot of stuff that you're throwing in your wet trash could technically go in your green barrel, you know, all your food waste. Um, so uh, I think they're going to try to figure out how to grow that program and make sure that uh, organic stuff is going into the green barrel in the future. But right now we're just trying to see in, in these areas, clearly, you know, three trucks coming down the street, uh, it, it highly impacts uh, not only the, the roads, but it impacts uh, Everybody trying to park and whatnot, you know, in uh, District 4, the, the roads are tight, people are parking on both sides, trash cans are out, they, you know, you're losing parking spaces. So uh, we're going to see how this plays out over six months and then reevaluate. Paul, go ahead. I think, did Athens get a reason why they didn't do it citywide? I think, well, when they, when we redid their contract, it was something that I had asked about, and uh, and they said they they would be willing to do it in a pilot fashion to see how it how it works out. They do two waste stream systems in other cities, so it clearly you know can uh, and is a functional process. But uh, but they were willing to do a pilot without charging us. So I think that's you know that's probably the case. Did they say any indication of what makes it a success or not? Um, no, no. But they will come back with metrics when they Sorry. when they present. Probably the same amount of trash. Um, no, it's going to be the same amount of trash. So, uh, if, if you think about it, right, you you may actually need more trucks, uh, even though it may be only one truck going down the street. You may need more trucks because those trucks are going to fill up faster, right? Um, so, yeah, with that, these are all the things they're going to need to figure out uh, until we all figure out how not to throw away as much stuff. Or, yeah, uh, Jenny, and then Rob. Pavement that was on A1, and then there was a bunch of asphalt left on our street. Yes. That never got picked up. Did you ever have a chance to figure out who? who that came? never got cleaned up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, no, that's that's news to me because I thought it did. So okay. Yeah. No, the this the regular city streeper, street sweeper, excuse me, it can't pick it up because I see no. it go over it, but it's too yeah. dense or I don't know. So I think it has to be the the people who did the pavement. They had a more heavy duty. Sweeper, okay. They may have to come back. Is that right in front of your house? No, it's actually up, like my neighbors and up closer further. toward the railroad tracks. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll uh, I'll resend that email tonight to Public Works and and follow up on that. Oh, Public Works. Okay. Yeah. And they're the ones who did all the sidewalk like shaving too. Mm -hmm. And our oh, that was nice. That was. Yeah, so, so what we try to do is anytime we're doing um, a, a repavement program on, on any street, we're all, they're going to see how much bang for our buck can we get. And in that case, right, uh, a lot of those um, curbs along Inglewood were not ADA accessible. So they made sure to build that into the contract uh, for, for that. So that's why they spent, I think, like three weeks doing just the sidewalks, and then they came in and did the, the pavement. Uh, and then we do that, we, we do those, um, every year we have uh, funds that comes from the federal government, uh, CDBG funds, and a portion of those funds always goes to creating uh, ADA curbs uh, in the city. So right now, um, actually, my, my street uh, and the street over, there's like about eight curbs in my neighborhood that are, you know, we happen to be in this year's 
you know, bucket of ones getting done, and then I saw a bunch getting done in District 5. So I think it gets apportioned throughout the city and, and just rotates each year to where wherever it's needed. Ron? So is District 3 still in the street improvement fund for this year? Everybody? Yeah. So, um, so every district is, we've changed, and I, we talked about this last year, Every, we're, we're changing the way we do it. When, um, when the city started its last uh, pavement management program back in like 2000 or 2001, they did it in sections. So they would say, all right, here's District 3 and, and this whole, you know, you look at the map and all these streets are gonna get done. And then next year, all this section. And they, they would go through the city in, in that fashion. When we finished up after, that, that program was supposed to be a an 11 year program and it got as when the recession hit it ended up dragging out right um, so we finished that last year what we're doing now is um, we are I, I don't want to use the word piecemeal but that's what it is we are really looking at um, the entire city and the streets that are in highest need at, at a variety of different levels of deterioration so uh, if a street needs to be like uh, what's called a two inch scrape, like go down deep and then totally resurface, uh, the amount to do that is ginormous, right? Versus a street that may just need a slurry seal. Um, so we're, we're doing two programs this year. One is a slurry seal program, and those are for streets that are uh, within like a five to seven year period of since they got paved, because we can extend the life of the street for um, an insignificant, well, a more insignificant amount of money than if we were to do a full repaving, right? Um, and then we are addressing streets throughout the entire city. It's primarily and uh, mostly in North Redondo, a handful in District 2 that are really getting uh, full on resurfacing. So Harkness uh, is one street, um, and then there's sections of other streets that, that will be done. And then each year, um, each year we will you know, continue to move through and, and take care of, uh, of, city, of streets. Now that's why last year, I don't know if you remember, I sent out an email, I said, let me know if you have a street that is that you feel like is in really high need. And, uh, and so then what I did was I submitted whatever came in from residents and then they compared that against the list and, and it's possible that maybe it bumped up a street. But we're, we're primarily looking at which streets are getting done uh, from a, a mathematical perspective because we have these machines every three years that go through and look at the entire surface of the street and actually grade them for how good or bad they are. So that's how it's, it, that, that creates what we call our pavement management index. Bye. Yes, on Goodman, um, the slurry people last time didn't have much slurrying to do because it didn't last. Before um, the rain season came, which isn't here yet, <laughs> um, fully, a um, bunch of us called and they said, okay, it's gonna be done. Well, they came out and they just, I mean, it's so thin, it is now wearing down. A slurry or is this like a pothole just, patching? No. Because we we, our neighborhood hasn't been slurried. In, our, well. You know, uh, I, I, we, haven't been, we, we, we haven't been repaved in, in 20 years. Okay, so, if you go down yeah. Goodman, you'll see exactly where they they put thin strips. Okay, so then that's 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 just like touch up work, kind of mm, stuff. Right, okay. and the touch up work is not holding up. Okay, and how can we find out where we are on that list? Because everybody says we're on the list, but I don't know who has the list. No, th so there is. There's a. <laughs> I, I can. Uh, I can, I'll put it up. I'll, I'll I'll put it up on my website and then send out a link to everyone. The, yeah, the because whole that's the problem yeah. we've had is we request things and then we don't hear about any follow up. We don't see anything done, and then when we see something else get done, that maybe isn't on our priority list as the greater whole community. Um, it seems like that could have been put to the last and the streets with the potholes could have been done but you know it's right hand left hand yeah we're spending like 10 million dollars this year yeah well i hope they yeah. spend a lot in <laughs> yeah. our area and how can we tell what how can we tell when our area is going to be done yeah so we i would put up the i i i can tell you which streets are going to get done this okay. year and then okay. sometime this year we'll find out what streets are going to get done next year all right um but 
they're going, you know, I, I don't know if they have a five-year plan that lists all the streets, but the pavement management index will list the conditions of all the streets, and we can kind of gauge which ones will be done sooner than later based on. I keep the saying we're on the list, but everybody's on that. The entire the entire yeah. city is on the list. Right? Yeah. yeah. The point yeah. is, we're we're trying to, we're trying to do it differently so that we can get the best bang for our buck and we can take care of our streets longer and and basically raise the index. We we don't have bad streets. Uh, really in comparison when you look at other cities. Uh, well, I'm just saying, if you, if you go by this pavement management index, we, we don't. Um, so, but, but, uh, but with that said, everybody likes a, a freshly you know, paved street, so, uh, so we're trying to do what we can in a situation where we have dwindling revenues and growing expenditures. So uh, it's a priority for everyone. It's just a matter of can we, how, can, how fast can we get it done? And, and uh, we're trying. Gar, did you have your hand up again? Or? I did. Um, okay. We had a tree on our street when they redid the water mains. Yes. Um, they tried to move it when they moved uh, the fire hydrant. The tree's dead. Um, there were some trees here by the school offices up here along it would have were removed. So I was wondering if there's a program to get those trees replaced. So when Cal Water was doing their work, was the was the tree uh, on the public right of way or it was, uh, it was on the or on uh, private property? It was on the uh, the green belt between the sidewalk. And between the the, okay, the right of way, but yeah, the easement. Yeah. Okay, so uh, s send me an email uh, specifically where the tree is and that it died when they did the Cal Water work, and we'll get Cal Water and Public Works to to knock heads on that, yeah, and get that replaced. So, is is, is there a program that is putting these uh, solar lights on the uh, lane dividers? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. Because two of them showed up on my street and I was looking at it, you know, it yeah. for about two weeks. Is this, I, I wonder if this is what you were talking about on Spire. On Spire, on Spire yeah. too, but Spire. on Haynes also. Yeah, no, I, I, I think somebody's putting those down on the street. That's oh, not, good the city's not doing that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I also fire, noticed, I also noticed some some people fire, were painting were painting um, on the street like where a car can park, you know, as if. But we don't yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That so, actually <laughs> worked really well in our neighborhood when they marked them off with chalk. Yeah, <laughs> with chalk <laughs> and put their names on them. No, but it, but it actually <laughs> were, people done. were taking two spots. They yeah. could fit three cars in there, so right. it, it actually yeah. worked. Yeah, well, if you if you do it, here, here's what I learned. If you if you officially, you know, if the city was to officially mark off spots, um, you you actually they are required to have X amount of space for the spot, and that'll be one car. So in a situation where two cars could have fit in that area without the markings, you've now lost technically a space. So it it's one of these things. So that's why they that we don't tend to put those down unless we absolutely have. Yeah, Jenny. Uh, I think Carr mentioned it, but do you happen to know what happened in the, within the past week here at the intersection at 187 in Inglewood where the wall is crashing? It looks like a car crashed into mm -hmm. the, the wall there. Did. 186 in Inglewood on your side or on the um, other side? On the south, south side, no. southwest. No, I'm not aware of it. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it happened last, I think it might have been, uh, mm -hmm. I remember what day I came around. I think it was on Friday afternoon. Okay. We had the lane block, police cars, tons of people standing around. And somebody looks like they hit that wall around yeah. you know, the house on the corner there. And it's pretty badly damaged. Yeah. You know, it, the driver it was probably distracted me. by the no left turn sign. That'll be here all week, folks. It took them long. Me and my kids stand there twice a day. Yeah. Um, that is not the first time that that has happened. That yeah. happens fairly frequently there, it really scared me. Yeah. Um, I want to see if there's something more that we can do to address that intersection and the safety. We have so many kids that cross there to get to the middle school, to get to Washington, and then CDC uses it to get to El Nido, and it's just, it, it's terrifying. You take your life in your own hands crossing it's, that street. It's, yeah, it's a high so, volume street. Is there a way that we can, like, get more lead time for the pedestrians? I mean, can we, can we do more? Well, we, so one thing I've requested is, and it's a CIP project, that just means a capital improvement project. Well, going back to, we were talking about the, um, the, the infrastructure there for the light pole, that requires, we, we can't just replace it. it, it's a big job. It needs totally new electronics down underneath. 
Um, so I, I have requested that we redo that, um, and I don't know where that where that is and if it's. I, I, I'm pretty sure we put it in the CIP last year, um, but I'll, I'll double check on that because um, we were talking about could we change the phasing of the the light there, you know, so that um, so that like maybe when you're going eastbound on 182nd from the school that like you would have. You wouldn't have to fight with the people coming westbound, so it would be a three-phase light. So um, north, south, Inglewood would would be one phase, and then east and west would be their own phase. Um, but again, to do that, we would require a total new architecture of the of the light there. So what about, um, I was told that the lead time for pedestrians was a simple like programming change, like that wasn't a hard. I don't thing. know. Yeah, like, that, these are good questions for Gene, and we we have to we have to do our normal. Uh, you know, I try to do that traffic meeting once a year, so we can have him here and, and get more in the weeds on questions like that with him. Uh, I do have a meeting with him on Wednesday, so I'll I'll be sure to ask yeah, uh, we, about that. But you're you're just saying, can you phase the pedestrian crossing to have uh, a little leeway time? Yeah. yeah, like so the pedestrians have like three seconds before the light, you know, turns green, so that people coming west down one eighty second yeah. turn left, because that's the that's the worst area. They don't see you, and we've almost been hit so many times. Anyone who's crossed the intersection. Yeah, could I mean, listen, we 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 are we've talked about this a zillion times. We're always trying to do whatever we can to ensure the safety of others. I don't know if anybody saw that awful video online where the woman and her kid got hit yesterday uh, or two days ago in L.A. And they were crossing safely at an intersection when they were supposed to be crossing. They were halfway across, and then they got hit by a car and went flying. Like you know, so we clearly can't control for bad drivers, you know, or people who are not paying attention. That's but we can always try to make it safer, and that's that and that's can. what we're trying to do, uh, Ron and Matthew. You may want to talk to the state, but they do have funding for pedestrian bridges that go over streets for kids near school. So. Or state funds that may be available for that. Well, we can always ask them. Yeah. Matthew. Uh, I think we're meeting with uh, Jean Kim on Wednesday. Yes. Uh, we've been waiting for uh, Carmelita and Goodman and Carmelita and Steinhardt. Yes. We'll do Bull Belt. Actually, uh, so Bonnie just called me about uh, that a couple days ago. And yeah, so. I talked to him like a couple weeks ago. I was like, oh, it's going to come to council on the consent calendar for review and approval, but it hasn't come yet. No, it hasn't. So, yeah. I, I try to do a quarterly meeting with him, anyways, and so. I'm going in just to follow up on that. Uh, so Steinhardt and Goodman were both were two areas that that we have requested, uh, and that he has already had one meeting with the neighbors. So uh, yeah, they, yeah, they had agreement on what to do. I don't know. I, I thought there was an agreement on what to do, but uh, but they were going to try something temporarily. To see. Well, yeah, the neighborhood wanted to put crosswalks at, at uh, Goodman and Carmelita and do a bowl out at Steinhardt and Carmelita. Right. And that's what the community wanted, and he said, not what I recommend, but okay, and that's what we're going to, uh, I understood we're going to move forward with, but we haven't seen. Yeah, I don't know, I and I, I don't recall, I haven't seen it go to the Public Works Commission either, so. Ah. I, I thought it did. But I don't recall. Yeah. If you could ask him about it, that would be I, I, I absolutely will. Thank you. All right, any last questions before we wrap up for tonight? All right, great. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll see you next month.